Old McKelly had a farm, E-I-E-I-O, and on his farm he had a robot tractor, a flower picker, and, oh, looks like we're taking on a new member of the team. If I'm honest, I'm as comfortable on a real farm as a cow would be in a data farm. But I'm here to see a world first. As farming gets more automated, it might not come as a surprise to know that many modern tractors will drive autonomously in a straight line. Nearly all of them, though, need a human operator to turn the corners and generally be the brains of the operation. What's interesting is that in this one field in Shropshire, in the heart of England, every single stage of the farming cycle, from preparing the soil to harvesting the crops, is automated. Welcome to the hands-free hectare. Researchers at Harper Adams University, along with agricultural engineers, have already completed a whole year of sowing, growing and harvesting spring barley, all using autonomous machinery yeah. and without a single human touching the crops. And how have you made them autonomous? It, it looks like you've had a go yourself. So everything we've used is off the shelf, you could buy yourself, um, and it revolves around the open source autopilot from a drone, and then we've had to adapt our tractors, manual controls with motors and actuators. And we'll come back to the hands-free hectare in a few minutes. These machines have an advantage for farmers because you don't need as many people operating or supervising them. And of course, farming automation is happening across the board. Last week, we saw a pepper picking robot in Australia. And as Brexit threatens to cut down the number of people available to work on the land, this could become increasingly important. Jen Copestake has been to the Netherlands to see some more developments in automated picking. Selective harvesting of delicate crops like strawberries, mushrooms and flowers is physical and repetitive work. The crops are easily damaged, resulting in financial losses for farmers. Traditionally, these industries have attracted migrant workers, but with standards of living rising across the globe, the work is not as attractive as it once was, leading some farmers to consider how robots could fill in the gaps. Many countries around the world are facing a labour shortage for harvesting crops, including here in the Netherlands, which has the world's second largest value of agricultural exports. It's the world's largest exporter of cut flowers. But are robots really ready to pick up the slack from human workers? At Wageningen University, researchers certainly think so, and are working on all kinds of problems in the fruit and vegetable supply chain, from testing firmness of fruit to manual handling. Firmness is usually tested by hand, by physically cutting the fruit and sticking a probe in it. It's a labor-intensive process, and the fruit is left damaged and can't be sold. Researchers think robots will provide a more accurate and hygienic solution that doesn't damage the fruit. It's a funny robot, yeah. right? So what yeah. are doing? It's a, a prototype for fruit inspection. How does it do that? With near infrared spectroscopy. Oh, wow. yeah. So he's happy with that apple? Yeah, he is happy with the apple. <laughs> yeah, I can look how happy he is. Yeah. <laughs> do you think he's going to go for a pear next? Uh, we don't know. He decides. He decides it's an that. autonomous robot. Yeah, so, yeah. A key breakthrough will be getting these machines to work faster than humans and in a commercial setting. Robots are already at work in the greenhouses here at Florensis. And these machines can autonomously plant 2,400 to 2,600 cuttings an hour compared to human working at a still impressive 1400 an hour. It recognizes the top and bottom of the cutting and even shakes the conveyor belt to free them if the camera can't get a good look. 
The only jobs left for the workers here are scattering the cuttings on the machine and quality control of the finished product. So before, how many human workers would be on this yeah, line? Yeah, on, on, on a line like this, with this capacity, uh, about 10 to 12 people needs to be, uh, needs to be sticking manually. Yeah. 10 to 12, and now yeah. you have how many? Two. Yeah. Fewer people does not mean less work can be done. At the end of the game, it, uh, you can work 24 hours of, of the day. Uh, you can save, let's say, up 60% of your labor cost. Uh, there are many aspects which, which is going to help the total process. Uh, I believe and I'm convinced that this is just a start and absolutely this will replace the human being. Bringing autonomous picking robots beyond prototypes to actually working in the field has been an immense challenge. But Dutch company Sariscon is ready to sell its white asparagus harvesting robots. It has sold one to a farmer in France and are building more in its headquarters near Eindhoven. White asparagus are more expensive than the green variety. It grows under the ground. To stay white, they need to be picked before seeing any sunlight. Uh, we actually inject an, an electrical signal into the ground and we have uh, these sensors which dig through the soil and when they approach the asparagus, they actually pick up the signal and the closer you get to the asparagus, the, more, the stronger the signal gets and when it's above a certain threshold, we know, oh, now we're very close, so we immediately pull back this uh, sensor and then we know where it is. The asparagus is actually conducting electrically the signal because there's a lot of water in there. So basically the difference between water content of the asparagus and the, and the sand, that makes the difference how we detect the asparagus. Sariscon says the three-row version of the machine can replace up to 70 manual hand workers. Is this machine more efficient than a human? Oh yes, yes, enormous, much more. And also you have better quality asparagus because we detect them subsurface, they do not uh, become violet and they don't flower. Um, and we have less subsurface damage. With the current way of manual harvesting, they lose 30% of the crops with subsurface damage. And uh, with our machine, we think we bring it back to 10 or 15%. We're seeing the race to develop these robots for market accelerating around the world. This is the Agrobot. It's being trialed in Driscoll's berry fields in California. Here in the UK, farmers are experimenting with the technology too. There are fears about the availability of migrant workers post-Brexit. I understand how uh, an indigenous population in a country like Britain may be reluctant to have a career in hand-picking strawberries. Uh, and so it tends to be done by migrant labour. Uh, there are access issues with that, with Brexit and the like. Uh, we're keen to maintain, as a farming industry, good access to that labour pool at the moment. But we can see that in 5, 10, 15 years' time, we may have technology whereby this, this work can be done by robots. A lot of work is being done to try and solve the labour crisis in selective harvesting with robots. Perhaps one day farms will look more like car plant assembly lines and humans picking fruits, vegetables and flowers will become a distant memory. That was Jen in the Netherlands. Back at the hands-free hectare in Shropshire, this little autonomous tractor is making its way across the field. This is footage from a proof-of-concept project in automated, sustainable farming, which means looking after the environment at the same time as growing enough food to meet the demands of a population that could reach nearly 10 billion people by the year 2050. But why have they chosen to use smaller tractors instead of the giant modern ones which can cover much larger areas? So with all the benefits of those big tractors, there's also the problems. The one main problem is the weight of the tractors, um, and that weight is doing lots of damage to the soil. And that is essentially the, the squishing and the removing of structure from a soil, which makes it very hard for plants to grow. So we see the solution as the one guy who's driving the big tractor then becomes like a, a swarm or a fleet manager of these smaller autonomous machines. Back in the field, I joined Kit Franklin in a cold, cramped control hut. So what are we looking at here? OK, so this is the telemetry coming back from the tractor. So you can see the position of the tractor, uh, where it's got to, and then you can see it meeting the waypoints, turning. 
As well as not compacting the soil, there is another advantage to using smaller vehicles. Small sprayers allow for precision farming. Now that means being able to deliver the right fertilizers and pesticides only to the plants that need it. When you blanket spray, a lot of spray isn't hitting target, it's hitting soil mm. and then just going into the environment. Mm. So with a smaller uh, robotic system, we aim to be much more precise and put targeted input. So if we only target the plant itself, we can drop that chemical use by 80% upwards, depending on whose papers you read. But how do you know which crops need special attention? Part of the deal with precision farming is knowing exactly what parts of your field need what kind of treatment. Now that's usually done by eye. You always come and look at the crops and the state of the soil. You might even dig up a few samples and from that work out what you need to spray where. Well here, even that part is automated. Drones fly autonomously between waypoints, capturing pictures of the field with specially adapted cameras. So we're looking at multispectral images, so looking at near-infrared type uh, parts of the spectrum. Under infrared, plants give away a lot. So we can look at disease stress or nutrient stress and things like that. And Kit says that even though you'd need a fleet of smaller tractors to do the work of one big tractor, each would cost just a fraction of the price of the big beast. Our machine that we're using in this field, I could sell you with some profit for £40,000. So you could have multiple of my robot tractors, my autonomous tractors, for the price of your one very large tractor that you currently might be buying. Um, I feel like I'm in some kind of car sale showroom at the moment. I'm, <laughs> I'm starting to be convinced. Yeah, I'll have five, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hello and welcome to The Week in Tech. It was of course a week dominated by Mark Zuckerberg's apologize-a-thon in Washington. That we didn't do enough to prevent these tools from being used for harm as well. While most observers thought the Facebook boss came out on top, big questions remain. Meme makers, meanwhile, have been working overtime, mocking the social media billionaire's performance in a US Congress grilling. Ouch. It was the week gesture control specialist Leap Motion revealed its latest project virtual wearable interfaces. You'll need an augmented reality headset though to bring this digital tech to life. Uber acquired bike sharing startup Jump and its 12,000 GPS tracked bikes across 40 cities worldwide. And hackers removed YouTube's most watched video, Despacito by Louis Fonzi. They also defaced vids by a host of big named acts like Drake and Taylor Swift. The clips are now back online as normal. Google's artificial intelligence boffins at DeepMind have been training an AI to navigate naturally through city streets like a human. Using Street View, the AI explores cities as if it's on foot, virtually, of course. The software could eventually help self-driving cars get around areas with rubbish maps. An escalator manufacturer has launched what it's claiming is the most boring virtual reality experience in the world, a never-ending journey on one of its escalators. Somebody gets paid to think of this stuff, you know. It was my mistake and I'm sorry. Yes, this is the week that Facebook faced the music as Zuck was called to Congress to answer tough questions about his company's treatment of its users' personal information. Well, that was the plan, but the internet was quick to point out that the senator's questions didn't so much expose Zuckerberg's flaws as they did their own lack of technical understanding. There will always be a version of Facebook that is free. Critics complain that because the whole theory of big data is so hard to get your head around, the hard questions weren't asked. But at least some managed to cut to the heart of the matter. Would you be comfortable sharing with us the name of the hotel you stayed in last night? Um. <laughs> uh, no. But you're following Facebook users even after they log off of that platform and application. Uh, Congresswoman, yes or no. that's right that we that we understand in order to show which of your friends. Yeah, so for people that like don't even page. have Facebook, I don't think that the average American really understands that. 
Of course, this story has a long way to run yet, but could Silicon Valley's view that technology is always a force for good have been dealt a fatal blow? Well, Jamie Bartlett is a longtime friend of Click, and in his latest book, The People vs. Tech, he argues that technology is slowly but surely eating away at society. Here he is to explain. Good evening. The social media giant Facebook is under growing pressure to explain the measures it's taking to secure the personal data of its two billion users worldwide. The revelations about Cambridge Analytica and Facebook have shocked the world. But this runs far deeper. It's just one example of a grand struggle taking place every day between modern technology and our democracy. Strong and stable leadership this country needs. You're not credible. Jeremy on this Jones, issue. I know there invest is no extra payment you don't want to take. Invest through. in health. Right. And you're right. You're the coalition. You do. The recent anti-gun movement in Florida, of course, demonstrates how modern technology can be brilliant for democracy. It allows people to organize themselves, to have access to new forms of information and get involved in politics. However, because of some of these very visible benefits, I think it's blinded us to the deeper ways that digital technology is slowly pulling democracy apart. It's a problem of compatibility. See, our democracies are old. They were designed for an analog age. And there's rules and institutions like free elections, a vibrant press, informed citizens that keep the whole thing working. But now there's a new game in town. Digital technology. And it runs according to very different rules. It's decentralized, it's hard to control, it's data-led, and it improves at an incredible speed. Think about it. Our elections have rules to make sure that citizens have access to the same information. That's how we thrash out the public issues of the day and make sure that what the candidates say is mostly accurate. But now, with big data analysis and micro-targeting, we can build up very detailed profiles of individuals and politicians can target them with highly personalised messages. This allows politicians to exploit our psychological vulnerabilities at an industrial scale and in a way that regulators can't easily see. It's out with the old public sphere of shared information and in with a million private spheres. Pretty soon, politicians will be able to send a million personalised messages to a million people. And how do we keep politicians to account if everyone's getting a different message? And do you know how much worse this could get? They can extract from this seemingly innocent information very accurate predictions about your religiosity, leadership potential, political views. One day soon, your fridge will know everything about your diet, your car will know what journeys you've been on, your home assistant will know your mood because of the tone of your voice. And you will be getting messages based on all that data. And that would open up a whole new world of possible manipulation. But it's us too. Democracies need informed citizens who have a shared sense of reality. But we're now overwhelmed with information, facts and claims and misinformation and propaganda. And it's allowing us to create our own versions of reality. That's making us more angry and far less likely to compromise with each other. In the end, there can only be one winner of this grand struggle. Either tech will destroy democracy and the social order as we know it, or politics will stamp its authority and control over the digital revolution. On the current track, technology is winning. And unless things change, democracy will be washed away, just like communism or feudalism or absolute monarchies before it, as a system that worked for a while, but then couldn't upgrade when the technology around it changed.
That was Jamie Bartlett on the People versus Tech. Blimey, I think we need something a bit more uplifting after that, don't you? Well, over the years, we've looked at some incredible technologies that help people with disabilities to gain more independence and a better quality of life. Well, up next, Kate Russell has had first-hand experience of the impact of a simple app on a family devastated by a chromosome disorder that's robbed a young boy of his voice. Most children start speaking their first words in the second year of life. People take it for granted until it doesn't happen. I travelled to the south of England to meet Bastian Pond. Hello! Hello! Hello. 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 And find out more about the impact this can have on a family. <laughs> You're making a train track. Bastian has Phelan McDermid syndrome. It affects only 1,500 people worldwide and is the result of a missing or mutated chromosome, which results in global development delay. In Bastian's case, this includes the absence of speech. Although Bastian can't talk, he does understand some of what's said. Would you like a drink? He's using Chatable to express basic needs and wants in reply. I want blackcurrant. All right, B. I want blackcurrant. Therapy Box is the company behind the app. So what was the inspiration behind it? I'm a speech and language therapist um, by trade and I've worked in the NHS and uh, worked with lots of young people and seen how um, if they don't have the right tools to communicate then they're really restricted and not able to reach their potential. In our app it's using photos for example of the child's environment to support their communication. Um, that might be a picture of their classroom or, their, or at home. Um, or, a, or a pages which are more like grids, so they've got a, a, an arrangement of symbols that they can press in order to make a sentence. Although Bastian's condition is incredibly rare, over 300,000 people in the UK have speech disabilities that could benefit from augmentative and alternative communication techniques. The Chatsport app itself, it's so versatile um, for the technology. Um, if you see here, that's actually an old PEX communication book. Um, it's cards and stickers with the symbols on them. Right. But this is so limited. Um, so this was what he used to use? Yeah. And then he shows it to me. Mm -hmm. uh, OK, and what does that say? Can I see that? Can you, you show, show it to Kate? It's cards. And, he's, cards. and he's signing cards to you as well. Right. So to move on from that, to being able to do it on, on the iPad is absolutely brilliant because it's unlimited. You can have as many symbols as you like. Right. What's been the effect on him of having a little bit more independence and also on the rest of the family? Well, I mean, I described it as being a miracle to Chatterball because that's really what it feels like. Um, it has given him a voice. And um, without me getting really upset, um, something we... We that upsets me that, that I will never hear him say I love you, mummy, or just call me mummy. Mm. Sorry, I'm just getting really emotional. Mm. <laughs> That's okay. but, but maybe with the app, he might be able to. It's clear this technology is making a huge difference for Bastian at home, and it will grow with him with educational tools and analytics to help develop language, reading, and writing. There's also a visual timetable, so he might one day be able to take more control over his daily life. At £99 per user, it's a lot of money, but the app will evolve with Bastion, and the developers promise ongoing support and updates for users. They also told us they're dropping the price to just £1 soon, which will make a great difference to many families. What do you think it would have been like sort of dealing with his condition without the technology. Oh my gosh, it doesn't even bear thinking yeah, about, does it? Yeah. It's think, his communication, it's enjoyment for him, it's downtime, he watches TV um, when he goes to bed, so the, the, the shows help him wind down. Mm. It's everything to him. High five! Yeah! <laughs> Brilliant, that's Kate Russell and Bastian Pond. Don't forget, we live on Facebook and on Twitter at BBC Clicks, so you can check in with us anytime you fancy. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon.